أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من اللسان يفقه قولي ربي ستني علما اللهم فقهنا في الدين إلهي آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I welcome all of you to our Fahm al-Quran 2022 um, series session number 25 so inshallah let's go through a quick recap So last time in Surah Ahzab, we discussed about the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 56, that Allah sends his salah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and also his angels, his malaika. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us, O you who believe, send your salah on him and greet him with the Islamic way of greeting. SubhanAllah, what a beautiful ayah and so much for us to learn from. Now, when we talk about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, have we ever envisioned meeting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah? Have we ever thought, what will we say to him the moment we see him for the first time? Will we immediately start talking to him or we will wait for someone else to start the conversation? Just imagine, what would be our emotions? As believers, we all love our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we yearn to be in his company, isn't it? For many of us, it's our utmost desire to see the Messenger of Allah in our dreams, right? But we don't. How jealous we should be of Anas radiallahu an, who would see Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his dream every single night and see his blessed face. But subhanAllah, we aren't, we're not as fortunate as Anas radiallahu an, right? So what do we do? What do we do now? The only hope that we have is to accompany the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in Jannah, inshaAllah. So how do we do that? There are few access codes to that. Number one, sincere love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al -mar'u ma you will be with the ones whom you love. So love is key. Number two, just like this ayah of Surah Ahzab said, sending peace and blessings upon him. Why? Because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the person closest to me on the day of Qiyamah is the one who sends the most blessings upon me. So we should do that. We should take out time from our daily schedule to recite the Number three, taking care of an orphan. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I am the person who looks after an orphan and provides for him will be in Jannah like this. And then he put his index and middle fingers together. SubhanAllah. So if we can take care of an orphan, sponsor an orphan, then we should do that. And lastly, there's another one, which is making abundant prostrations. So let me share a quick story with you. One of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his name was Rabia ibn Qa'ad radiallahu an. He was from Ahlul Sufa. Who are these people? These are people who had dedicated their lives to study Islam. So they would stay in the masjid on, and they would stay in the masjid on bare minimum. And they would just keep themselves busy studying the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He lived in the shadow of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rabi'a radiallahu an used to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whenever, wherever he went. Whenever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would cast a glance in his direction, he would quickly leap to stand in his presence. 
subhanallah. Why did he do that? Because he loved serving him. So one day, Rabia comes to the Prophet وسلم, with a glass of water. And the Prophet وسلم, just, just looks at him. He's a young man, yet he's wearing tattered clothes. He doesn't have much to eat or drink. So the Prophet وسلم, feels pity for him. So he says, Ya Rabia, ask me anything you want today. You want house? You want to get married? What do you want? Ask me. I'll make dua for you. SubhanAllah. Imagine living the moment that you and me are the assistants of the Prophet وسلم, and we're given one dua, which is guaranteed to be answered. SubhanAllah. Just close your eyes for a moment and think about it. What is that one dua going to be? Verbalize it. What are we going to ask? SubhanAllah. But what did Rabia radiallahu anh respond? He said, I ask you to beseech Allah most high on my behalf to make me your companion in Jannah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa asks him again, almost to say, oh Rabia, I'm not talking about akhirah. I'm asking you about here in dunya. What do you want? You want wife? You want children? Money? What do you want? He says nothing. Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I want your companionship. I cannot bear to be separated from you. Ya Rasulullah, that's all I need. Just like how close I am to you in dunya, I wish to be with you in Jannah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam becomes silent for a while. And he says that in that case, assist me for your sake, by performing much prostration to Allah. SubhanAllah, look at the desires of the companions. Let us reflect as to how the companions yearned for the company of the, of the Prophet ﷺ. Not just in this life, but even the life to come. Some of them couldn't even endure parting with him. These were the companions, and this was the quality of their du'as. You know why were all prophets so successful? Because they made a lot of du'as. And not only they supplicated a lot, we also see from their khuluq that they were the recipients of so many du'as from different individuals out there whom they would help, they would care, they would assist. So they would make du'a for them. And this is the legacy the companions followed. How did Rabia radiallahu anh got this golden opportunity that any one of us would wish to be the recipient of this dua, right? SubhanAllah, he was able to receive this dua because of his love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And not just love. Due to the obedience of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa because out of love comes obedience. And then not just obedience, how much khidmah he did for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He served him, he took care of him, and he was at his disposal all the time. SubhanAllah. What do we learn from here? That the access code to be the companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Jannah teaches us one, that let us send peace and blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let us try to increase our sujood. Let us obey the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and follow his sunnah. And last but not the least, let us adopt good khuluq, good character and serve other people. Do their khidmah, take care of them, be compassionate towards them. And inshallah, we hope to be the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Jannah, inshallah. Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. With that said, inshallah, we will begin our session for today. Audhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We will begin from Surah Fatir, ayah number 27.
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tara anna Allah anzala minas sama ima fa'akhrajna bihi thamaratin muhtalifan alwanuha wa min al jibali judadun bidun wa humrun muhtalifun alwanuha wa garabi busud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do you not see that Allah sends down water from the sky and we produce therewith fruits of various colors and among the mountains are streaks white and red of varying colors and others very black. And likewise men and moving living creatures and cattle are of various colors. It is only those who have knowledge among his slaves that fear Allah. Verily Allah is almighty, oft forgiving. Verily, those who recite the book of Allah, this Quran, and perform salah, and spend in charity out of what we have provided for them, secretly and openly, they hope for a sure trade gain that will never perish. So what is one goal that we can take out from this ayah? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people who do yatuluna kitab Allah, who recite the book of Allah, who read and study the book of Allah, just like what we're doing, what else should we do other than this as an implementation of this Quran? Number one, aqamu salah, we should establish salah. And number two, anfaqu mimma razaqnahum, sirra wa alaniya. We should spend in the way of Allah secretly and publicly. So let us make a goal. Today, I have to spend in the cause of Allah somehow. Somehow, I have to spend in the cause of Allah something which is a secret between me and him. Whether it's dropping a donation in the masjid, donation box, whether it is reaching out to someone in need, or whether it is um, donating some money in a charity organization, let us do something and donate in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today as a direct implementation of this ayah, inshallah. Ayah number 30, Surah Fatir. That he may pay them their wages in full and give them even more out of his grace. Verily, he is oft forgiving, most ready to appreciate. And what we have revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of the book, the Quran, it is the very truth and your followers must act on its instructions, confirming that which was revealed before it. Verily, Allah is indeed well acquainted and all seer of his slaves. Then we gave the book, the Quran, as inheritance to such of our slaves whom we chose. Then of them are some who wrong their own selves, and of them are some who follow a middle course, and of them are some who are, by the permission of Allah, foremost in good deeds. That inheritance of the Qur'an, that is indeed the great success. So we should ask ourselves, which category do I belong to? Am I belonging to the category of فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمُ nafsi, The ones who wrong ourselves? Or do I belong to the category of وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَسِدْ I follow a middle course. Sometimes I wrong myself. Sometimes I commit mistakes. Sometimes I sin and sometimes I perform good deeds. Or do I fall into the third category? They are foremost in good deeds. They are always ahead. Ibn Abbas radiallahu an said, those who are foremost in good deeds will enter Jannah without being brought to account. Those who follow a middle course will enter Jannah by the mercy of Allah and those who wrong themselves. And Ashab al-Araf will enter Jannah by the intercession of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we should ask ourselves, which category do I wish to belong to? Ayah number 33, Aden Jannah, will they enter? Therein will they be adorned with bracelets of gold and pearls, and their garments therein will be of silk. And they will say, all praise and thanks are to Allah who has removed from us all grief. Verily, our Lord is indeed oft forgiving, most ready to appreciate who out of his grace has lodged us in a home that will last forever, where toil will touch us not, nor weariness will touch us. But those who disbelieve, for them will be the fire of hell. 
Neither will it have a complete killing effect on them so that they die, nor shall its torment be lightened for them. Thus do we requite every disbeliever. Therein they will cry, our Lord, bring us out. We shall do righteous good deeds, not the evil deeds that we used to do. Allah will reply, did we not give you lives long enough so that whosoever would receive admonition could receive it? And the warner came to you, so taste the evil of your deeds. For the wrongdoers, there is no helper. Verily, Allah is all-knower of the unseen of the heavens and the earth. Verily, he is all-knower of that is in the chests. He it is who has made you successors, generations after generations in the earth. So whosoever disbelieves on him will be his, on him will be his disbelief. And the disbelief of the disbelievers adds nothing but hatred of their Lord. And the disbelief of the disbelievers adds nothing but loss. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell me or inform me what you think about your so-called partner gods to whom you call upon besides Allah. Show me what they have created of the earth or have they any share in the heavens or have we given them a book or that they act on a clear proof therefrom. No, the wrongdoers promise one another nothing but delusions. Verily, Allah grasps the heavens and the earth, lest they should move away from their places. And if they were to move away from their places, there is not one that could grasp them after him. Truly, he is ever most forbearing, oft forgiving. And they swear by Allah, their most binding oaths, that if a warner came to them, they would be more guided than any of the nations before them. Yet when a warmer Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a warner, came to them, it increased in them nothing but flight. They took to flight because of their arrogance in the land and their plotting of evil, but the evil plot encompasses only him who makes it. Then can they expect anything else but the sunnah way of dealing of the people of the old? So no change will you find in the sunnah of Allah and no turning off will you find in the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sunnah literally means way. So the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that those people who flee away from guidance, who flee from guidance due to arrogance, then they are going to be destroyed. So again, what should we do in order to receive the pleasure of Allah? We have to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Have they not traveled in the land and seen what was the end of those before them, though they were superior to them in power? Allah is not such that anything in the heavens or in the earth escapes him. Verily, he is all knowing and all omnipotent. And if Allah were to punish men for that which they earn, he would not leave a moving living creature on the surface of the earth, but he gives them respite to an appointed term. And when their term comes, then verily, Allah is ever all seer of his slaves. Meaning, if we were held accountable, if we were seized for our sins immediately, then there would not be a moving living creature on the earth left. None of us would remain. But subhanAllah, it is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us respite so that we can seek tawbah, so that we can correct our ways. So even in this is a mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is his rahmah, alhamdulillah. So that's the conclusion of Surah Fatih. And now we shall begin Surah Yasin. So let us listen to the recitation. إنك لمن المرسلين على صراط مستقيم تنزيل العزيز الرحيم لتنذر قوما ما تنذر آباؤهم فهم غافلون لقد حق القول على أكثر فهم لا يؤمنون 
So let's begin. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Surah Yaseen, just number 22. And Surah Yaseen is also a Makki surah. So we just notice and reflect over the similar themes of all the Makki surahs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off by saying Yaseen. And these are the Haruf al muqattad I number two, by the Quran, full of wisdom, truly you, O messenger, are one of the messengers. On a straight path, this is a revelation sent down by the Almighty, the Most Merciful, in order that you may warn a people whose forefathers were not warned, so they are heedless. Indeed, the word of punishment has proved true against most of them, so they will not believe. Verily, we have put on their necks iron collars reaching to the chins, so that their heads are raised up. And we have put a barrier before them and a barrier behind them. And we have covered them up so that they cannot see. It is the same to them whether you warn them or you do not warn them, they will not believe. You can only warn him who follows the reminder and fears the most gracious Ar-Rahman in the unseen. You bear to such one the glad tidings of forgiveness and a generous reward. So over here in Surah Yasin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off this surah by reminding us about the importance of guidance. How essential is guidance? And we come to learn from a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, for everything there is a heart and for the Quran, this is Surah Yasin. And whoever recites it, it is as if he has recited the Quran 10 times. So Surah Yasin is the heart of the Quran. Because what is a heart? Basically, what's the significance of a heart? SubhanAllah, it pumps our blood, right? It keeps us alive. So Surah Yasin reminds us about the essential need of Hidayah. If a person is guided, then he is successful. But if a person shuns Hidayah, leaves Hidayah, flees away from Hidayah, then he is doomed. And that's the reason why we also come to learn from another hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, recite Surah Yasin to the dying ones amongst you. Not the dead, the dying ones, meaning the people who are on Sakaratul Maut. Rasulullah asked us to recite Surah Yasin over them. Why? So that they can have a hope. They can remember the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which are coming to their way. Because what happens generally when a person is about to pass away, he is in despair. He is apprehensive. He doesn't know what he going to expect in the next life, in Varza. So he is in the midst of fear and hope. So this surah, if we recite it on our dying people, then it gives hope to them. And subhanAllah, and this is another thing that we should remember, that surah the Yasin is not supposed to be read on the dead. Meaning once a person passes away, we all get together and then we recite surah Yasin. Again, subhanAllah, the person is gone. Right? The person is gone. And this surah, this Quran is for the living ones, for the people who are alive to seek Hidayah. So when we do that, when we recite Surah Yasin after a person passes away, it actually benefits us because we are the ones who are alive. So we should take benefit for, from it. So let us remember that this Quran is not for the dead. It's for the living people. This Quran is not only for the purpose of reciting the Quran when a person passes away, but the purpose of the Quran is Hidayah. This Quran is not just to be recited in the month of Ramadan, on the day of Jum'ah. Rather, this Quran is supposed to be a part of her daily schedule every single day. Because if we have Hidayah, that's how we will have life 
in dunya and in akhirah. In dunya, we will be guided, so we will be successful. And in akhirah, the real life is the life of Jannah. And that is true success. So just like a heart keeps a person alive, this Quran grants us life in akhirah, the life of Jannah, the life of the ones who are successful. So let us proceed with the surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 12, verily, inna nahnu nuhi al mawta wa naktubu ma qaddamu wa atharahum wa kulla shay'in ahsaynahu fi imam al mubeen. Verily, we give life to the dead and we record that which they send before them and their traces, their athar, and all things we have recorded with numbers as a record in a clear book. So what do we learn from here? SubhanAllah, just like a Fitbit, we all like to wear Fitbits in order to track our steps, right? Daily record of steps. However, SubhanAllah, the record of angels is similar to a Fitbit, but technologically much more advanced and powerful. Why so? Because this is the record of the angels where they have managed to record each and every footstep of ours. Whether it was for a positive cause or a negative cause, every movement is recorded. But the interesting thing is, if we are true believers, if we are pious Muslims, and we left a positive impression behind us, then we will be pleased to see our footsteps on the day of Qiyamah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, خَيْرُ مَا يُخَلِّفُ الرَّجِلُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ ثلاث. The best of what a man leaves behind are three. وَلَدٌ صَالِحٌ يَدْعُوا لَهُ A righteous child who supplicates for him. وَصَدِقَةٌ تَجْرِي يَبْلُغُهُ أَجْرُهَا Ongoing charity, the reward of which reaches him. وَعِلْمٌ يُعْمَلُ بِهِ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ A knowledge that is acted upon after him. So let us dissect this hadith. Option one speaks about waladun salih. What does it mean? It means a child who is righteous. Now this is a jackpot for all of us. If we manage to raise up righteous children, each time he or she makes dua for us, we will receive it as gifts of joy in our grave, in our qabr, as bonus hasanat. Imagine, subhanAllah, what a jackpot. We're not even doing anything, but we're still receiving bonus hasana right in our graves. So let us try to put in time and efforts in the tarbiyah of our children. However, at times, there are people, there are couples who are not blessed with children. Then what should they do? SubhanAllah, Allah is so Rahman, he's so compassionate, he's so merciful that Allah has given us another option. Let us be like Ummul Mu'mineen, Aisha radiallahu anha, and dedicate our life to teaching and preaching Quran. Because what is the hadith tells us? So that after we're dead and long gone, the students who continue to benefit from our teachings can become a sadaqah jariyah for us, insha'Allah. They can send us bonus hasana right there when we are in our grave, lying helpless. That would be a great pleasure to receive such a beautiful gift. However, at times, people are not blessed with so much knowledge, right? They have more wealth than knowledge. Each one of us cannot be a teacher, cannot be a preacher. So what should we do? Do not despair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us another option. What should we do? Sadaqatun tajiri. We should try to pursue for projects that will reap benefits for us after our death, such as investing money in welfare projects like hospitals, schools, domestic shelters, masajid, welfare organizations who help the poor. Invest 
and purchasing Quran and keeping it in the masjid and giving it to the non-Muslims so that they can accept Islam. It can be a means of hidayah for them. So we can do either one of them, but how wonderful it would be if we hit the jackpot. Meaning, what if we do all these three things? If we do that, we are making a difference in the lives of other people. We will be creating an impact in their hearts. And what would happen? It will automatically make us become a recipient of their du'as. The Prophet said, the supplication of a Muslim for his Muslim brother in his absence will certainly be answered. And how can we receive a supplication from our Muslim brother or sister if we leave a positive legacy behind? Why? Because once our record of deeds are sealed, this is one coupon which can benefit us in our grave as well. What is it? The supplication of our children, our students, and all the people that we have helped. All the places where we have donated. And we definitely need this, right? An incident is reported from the stories of the Salaf. Once a girl died during a plague. Her father saw her in a dream after her death and asked her in the dream to tell him something about the next life. Meaning a father had a daughter who passed away. So he saw her in a dream and he asked her, how does Barzakh look like? What does it feel like? And she responded, oh my father, this is a big subject that you have raised. We know, but we cannot act. You can act, but you do not know. By Allah, one or two acts of tasbih, glorification, and one or two rakah of salah in the book of my actions are preferable to me than the world and all it contains. That's how helpless the people in the grave are. That one tasbih, one saying of subhanallah, alhamdulillah, allahu akbar, is preferable to them, more worthy for them than the world and everything that it contains. Praying two rakah of salah, salat al-shukr, or the 12th sunnah of the day, salat al-tahajjud, qiyam al-layl, is more preferable for them than the world and all it contains. <laughs> SubhanAllah, may Allah forgive us. How much time we waste doing nothing? How much time we waste procrastinating and slacking off? Right? So we should remember this ayah. <laughs> Whatever we do, our steps, our athar are being written down. Where so? In a clear record. In a clear record. So this ayah, ayah 12 of Surah Yasin teaches us that the footsteps that we take in terms of actual footsteps or the virtual footsteps that we take, everything is written down. Everything is counted. So now we spoke about some of the footsteps, meaning the not apparent footsteps, but the efforts that we make, they are written down. How about the actual footsteps? Are they written down as well? Yes, they are. We learned from a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where he said, whoever visits a sick person or visits his brother for the sake of Allah, a caller calls out saying, you have done good. Your footsteps are blessed and you have prepared an abode in Jannah. SubhanAllah. So if you were to visit a sick person, this is the reward for it. SubhanAllah. Your footsteps are counted. If you were to visit a person 
to give condolences because someone in their family passed away and you did it only for the sake of Allah to gain his pleasure. This is glad tiding for you. This is good news for you. Another glad tiding is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he who purifies himself in his house then walks to the masjid of Allah, the houses of Allah for performing the obligatory prayer. One step of his will wipe out his sins and another step will elevate his rank in Jannah. SubhanAllah, just imagine that nowadays we're going for Salatul Taraweeh and at times we got such a far away parking that SubhanAllah, it takes so long to come to the masjid to pray. Just remember this hadith, each one of your footsteps that you're taking all the way from the parking lot to the masjid, each and every footstep is being recorded. SubhanAllah. And what could be better than this? Right? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us so that we can have a good record. We can produce a beautiful book which we would love to be published on the day of Qiyamah in front of the public. Ya Allah, we wish and we pray and we hope that we are able to document such good books that we do not face any humiliation on the day of Qiyamah. I mean. I number 13, and put forward to them a similitude to the story of the dwellers of the town. When there came messengers to them, and we sent to them two messengers, they denied them both. So we reinforced them with the third, and they said, Verily, we have been sent to you as messengers. They, the people of the town, said, You are only human beings like ourselves, and the most gracious Ar Rahman has revealed nothing. You are only telling lies. So we see that there are prophets and messengers who are mentioned in the Quran by name, and there are also prophets who are not mentioned by name. So we do not have the exact names of these three prophets who came to this town. However, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us is that all three of them were rejected. Nobody accepted their message. So what happened? The messenger said, our Lord knows that we have been sent as messengers to you and our duty is only to convey plainly the message. They, the people said, for us, we see an evil omen from you. If you do not cease, we will surely stone you and a painful torment will touch you from us. And that teaches us that we should refrain from omens and superstitions. Why? Because they lead us towards negativity. And Islam inspires us to use the optimist approach and stay positive. So look at the audacity of these people that when the messengers gave the message of Islam to them, the people thought that they are evil omens for them. The messenger said, your evil omens be with you. Do you call it evil omen because you are admonished? Meaning because you're advised? No, but you are a people who are transgressors. And there came a man running from the farthest part of the town. He said, oh, my people, obey the messengers. Obey those who ask no wages of you for themselves and who are rightly guided. So over here, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a person who did what? Yas'a. Meaning he kept running and running. And why was he in such a rush? Because he wanted to tell the people about Islam. He wanted to tell the people to obey the messengers. That's why he was in a rush. SubhanAllah. And we learn about this person, that this person, he was not a very um, you know, normal, happy person like any one of us. It's reported in the tafsir that this person was a person who suffered from leprosy. But despite the fact, despite his sickness, he was very charitable. Despite the sickness, he didn't make his sickness an excuse not to tell his people about Islam. Rather, that was his main concern. That was his priority. 
So he rushed the people to the people in order to tell them to obey the messengers. And we should ask ourselves, subhanAllah, are we that keen? Are we that zealous to tell others to follow Islam, to follow Allah, to obey the Prophet? Are we able to sacrifice our sleep, our rest, in order to preach Islam to our children, to our relatives? Or do we make our health as an excuse? Do we make our job as an excuse? Do we make our children and family time as an excuse? No, these excuses are not going to be worth it on the day of Qiyamah. So let us get up, let us be zealous, and let us show the positive attitude and follow these righteous people and not be lazy. SubhanAllah. So what happened next? I number 22. And this is going to be the beginning of just number 23. The people said, and why should... I not worship him sorry the person said why should I not worship him who has created me and to whom you shall be returned shall I take besides him gods if the most gracious ar-Rahman intends me any harm their intercession will be of no use for me whatsoever nor can they save me then verily I should be in plain error verily I have believed in your lord so listen to me now, subhanAllah, Dawa tactic we learned from him. What is it that this person is saying, I have believed in your Lord? Meaning the Rabb that I worship, he's my Rabb and your Rabb. The messenger that I'm following, that messenger is sent to you and me. So then let's follow them. Let's benefit from them. And let's not be deprived. From Hidayah. So I number 26, it was said to him, when the disbelievers killed him, enter Jannah, he said, would that my people knew? Would that my people knew? SubhanAllah. So the story has some ellipses in the narration, some fill in the blanks over here where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't mention how the people tortured this person, how the people tormented this person, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that at the end for him was that his people eventually killed him. They did not listen to this man. They did not show any respect to this person. Rather, they killed him. But what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Qilad hulil jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him. It was said to him, enter Jannah. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors a person who makes Islam his priority. Who are velvishers for others, who are haris for the hidayah of other people. So when he was told to enter Jannah, what did he say in Barza? I wish my people knew. What should they have known? I number 27, that my Lord has forgiven me and made me of the honored ones. SubhanAllah. We learned that this person was truly a well-wisher for his nation. The people have killed him. And this person is in Barzakh and he is being given the glad tidings of Jannah, yet his heart is yearning that I wish my people knew about this reward. If they knew about it, they would not stay away from Hidayah. We should ask ourselves, are we a well-wisher for our family, our friends? When we make dua to Allah, is it just a superficial dua? On the surface, that Ya Allah, guide me, guide my family, guide all of us, that's it. Or do we truly feel for them? Does my heart feel the pain? When I see someone away from Hidayah, does my heart, does my eye shed tears? That Ya Allah, I wish that my kids can understand the value of being. Ya Rab, I wish that my family can get connected with this Quran. Ya Rab, 
I wish that my, st my spouse starts praying Salah. I wish that my friends fast in the month of Ramadan. Do I truly feel this? When our du'as are uttered with the depths of our heart, then that's what, what, that's what will define us as a true well-wisher. So the highlight of this person is, subhanAllah, no one knows the name of this person. No one knows how successful he was in terms of his um, secular education. No one knows how much wealth this man possessed. But one highlight out of his entire khuluq is the fact that he was haris for the hidayah of others. He cared for them, not just for their dunya, but for their akhara. So let us be that kind of elder who care for the akhira of other people, inshallah. I number 28. And we sent not against his people after him a host from the heaven, nor was it needful for us to send such a thing. It was but a saiha, and lo, they all were still silent, dead, and destroyed. Meaning, these people, this nation, they were destroyed because they disbelieved in all the three messengers and they killed a wali of Allah. So that's the danger of not following the prophets. That's the danger of harming the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I number 30. Alas for mankind, there never came a messenger to them, but they used to mock at him. Do they not see how many of the generations we have destroyed before them? Verily, they will not return to them. And surely all, every one of them will be brought before us. And a sign for them is the dead land. We give it life and we bring forth from its grains so that they eat thereof. And subhanAllah, this is in fact a very big sign. Look at the amount of sprinklers that we purchase in order to keep our, our yards green our grass green. But subhanAllah, think about all the trees in the entire world. Think about the trees which are in the most remote islands of the world. Which sprinklers are out there? Who nourishes them every single year after winter? Who are able, who is able to bloom, bloom all those flowers in the month, in the weather of spring? <laughs> It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah gives us these different analogies so that we can reflect that this is how easy it is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring the dead grass to life every single year. To give leaves to the naked trees every single year. Then definitely the resurrection is very easy for Allah. It is not difficult. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I number 34, and we have made therein gardens of date palms and grapes, and we have caused springs of water to gush forth therein, so that they may eat of the fruit thereof, and their hands did not make it. Will they not then give thanks? Meaning if all the fruits of the entire world, they die, they perish, then how are we going to eat? If there is no grain, if there are no fruits, if there are no vegetables growing, then what are we going to do? Who supplies all that food to us? It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah, glorified is he who has created all the pairs of that which the earth produces, as well as of their own humankind and of that which they know not. And botany today tells us that even the plants have pairs. Subhanallah, just like all of us have pairs. Just like in the creation, the night and day are pairs. Even the plants have pairs, subhanAllah. And who could know this 1400 years ago? And a sign for them is the night. We withdraw therefrom the day and behold, they are in darkness. And the sun runs on its fixed course for a term appointed. That is the decree of the Almighty, the All-Knowing. And the moon we have measured for it mansions to traverse till it returns like the old dried curved date stock. SubhanAllah, what do we learn? Each time, each month, when we see these transitions of the moon, it should remind us that SubhanAllah, 
just like the moon has stages, our life has stages too. When we are born, subhanAllah, we're all energetic, we're all healthy. When we reach adulthood, we're just like the full moon, shining bright, so successful. And then what happens? We go back to our original form. Old age strikes us. And then we become just as helpless as we were when we were born. SubhanAllah. To every single time we look at the moon, even in that, there is an advice for us. There is a reminder for us that we are soon going to die. What have we prepared for our akhirah? It is not for the sun to overtake the moon, nor does the night outstrip the day. They all float each in an orbit. Again, subhanAllah, long time ago, it was believed that the sun is stationary and all the planets are revolving around it. But subhanAllah, now research tells us, astronomy tells us that every single planet, even the sun, all the celestial bodies, they're all floating in an orbit. SubhanAllah. Who would have known this 1400 years ago? And an ayah signed for them is that we carried their offspring in the laden ship of Nuh. And we have created for them of the like they're onto on which they ride. And if we will, we shall drown them and there will be no shout or helper for them to hear, nor will they be saved. And thus it will be a mercy from us and as an enjoyment for a while. And when it is said to them, fear of that which is before you and that which is behind you in order that you may receive mercy. And never came an ayah from among the ayat of their Lord to them, but they did turn away from it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us many wake up calls, subhanAllah, in the form of the creation, in the form of the calamities that struck us. Like for instance, what happened to the nation of Nuh alayhi salam. We have so many reminders around us. But what do we do? We snooze the button and we go back in slumber. SubhanAllah, many people say, I can fast, but I cannot wake up for Fajr. I cannot do suhoor, even though we know that there's barakah in suhoor. Rasulullah encouraged us to do suhoor. SubhanAllah, we all know that salah is obligatory on us the moment we hit puberty. But what do we do? We are still so ghafil about it, so heedless about it. Our phone keeps on ringing on our tablets, on our cell phones, but we're still so heedless that we do not wake up. We're just like dead bodies. And compare that to the time when we have to catch a flight. Compare it to the time when we have to go for work. How quickly we wake up. How zealous we are to reach on time. Are we so zealous to pray salah on time? to catch Salatul Fajr? And this is a question that we should pose to ourselves and correct ourselves, inshallah. It's still not too late. We can still repent and we can still correct ourselves, inshallah. I number 47, and when it is said to them, spend of that which Allah has provided you, those who disbelieve, they say to those who believe, shall we feed those whom if Allah willed, he himself would have fed? You are only in plain error. And they say, when will this promise, the resurrection, be fulfilled, if you are truthful? They await only but a single shout, which will cease them while they are disputing. Then they will not be able to make the quest, nor will they return to their families. And the trumpet will be blown. And behold, from the graves, they will come out quickly to their Lord. They will say, woe to us, who has raised us up from our place of sleep? It will be said to them, this is what the most gracious Ar-Rahman had promised, and the messengers spoke the truth. Imagine taking an exam. SubhanAllah, these are the prep classes that we're studying right now. This Quran that we're studying right now. These are the exam prep classes. 
But imagine the day of the final examination. When it comes, the alarm is going to ring, meaning the trumpet is going to be blown, and we will quickly rush to Arab. We'll quickly wake up from our graves, regardless of the fact whether we woke up for Fajr in dunya or not. We will rush to go to Arab on the day of Qiyamah. And then what's going to happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it will be but a single shout. So behold, they will all be brought up before us. Each one of us will be gathered in front of Arab. This day, none will be wronged in anything, nor will you be requited anything except that which you used to do. So imagine, the examiner, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is going to tell us, وَلَا تُظْلَمُ نَفْسٌ شَيْئًا وَلَا تُجِزَوْنَا إِلَّا مَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ You will not be requited for anything except that which you used to do. Imagine the thoughts that would be running in our mind. What did I do? What did I used to do in dunya? Did I do good deeds? Was I able to pray all my prayers? Was I able to fast the month of Ramadan? Was I able to obey my parents? Was I able to help the poor and the needy? Was I able to give sadaqah? What did I do? Did I do a lot of good deeds? Or no? Are my good deeds sufficient to be heavy on the mizan on the day of Qiyamah? Or they are like haba'a manthura, as Allah describes, as scattered dust. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verily, the people who will have their mizan heavy with hasanat, verily the dwellers of Jannah that day will be busy with joyful things. Meaning the results will be out on the day of Qiyamah and the people who pass their exam with flying colors, they are going to be busy. Fi subulin fakihun with joyful things. In dunya, they kept themselves busy with the worship of Allah, serving the creation of Allah, taking care of the creation of Allah. That day, they will have time for themselves. In dunya, they were not able to rest that much. They were not able to relax that much because they had to sacrifice their sleep to pray Qiyamul Layl. They had to sacrifice their rest to serve the creation of Allah. Help them volunteer in the masajid, take care of the poor and the needy. So in Jannah, they will have their own time, their own privacy. All the fun that they always wish to have, they're going to have it. So fi shugulin fakihun. They and their wives, their spouse will be in pleasant shade, reclining on thrones. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala especially mentions about reclining because in dunya they were not able to recline much. They didn't have time to have family time much because again, they were busy pleasing Allah and serving the creation of Allah. So in Jannah, they and their spouse are going to have one-on-one -on -one time. They're going to have much time to spend with each other. Doing what? Relaxing in pleasant shade, reclining on thrones. Canopy beds are mentioned. They will have their in fruits of all kinds and all that they ask for. Whatever they wished. But they didn't have access to it in dunya. Either they couldn't afford it or because it was haram. They will have access to wines of Jannah to anything that their heart desires. It will be said to them, Salam, peace be on you, a word from the Lord Allah, most merciful. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents to us the opposite scenario. The people who are not able to pass their exam. The people for whom the mizan was not heavy with hasanat. It will be said to them,
or criminals be a part this day? It's mentioned that one scholar kept reciting this ayah over and over again. What is it? That in dunya, people were together. On the day of Qiyamah, the people will be together. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَمْتَازُ الْيَوْمَ أَيُّهَا الْمُجْرِمُونَ A call will be given to people that now is the time for separation. You have to segregate from your friends, from your family members. Why? Because you didn't make it. You're not able to enter Jannah because your good deeds are deficient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, be apart this day from the believers. Did I not command you, O children of Ibn Adam, that you should not worship shaitan? Verily, he is a plain enemy to you. And that you should worship me alone. That is the straight path. So hada sirat mustaqim. What is the straight path? This Quran is a straight path. And indeed, he, Shaitan, did lead astray a great multitude of you. Did you not then understand? This is Jahannam, which you were promised. Meaning we knew about Jahannam. We knew about the trauma and the horrors of Jahannam. Jahannam was literally sketched out for us in the Quran. Jahannam was literally sketched out for us in the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But what did we do? We stayed heedless. We stayed in ghafla. So it will be said to them, Islaw halyama bima kuntum takfurun. Burn therein this day because of your kufr, because of your ingratitude. This day we shall see up their mouths and their hands will speak to us and their legs will bear witness to what they used to earn. And imagine, subhanAllah, now in dunya, we try to protect ourselves. We try to defend ourselves by lying, by cheating, by deception. But imagine on that day, our own limbs will start, will start to witness against us. Our own body parts, our legs, our, our hands, they're going to witness against us. SubhanAllah, imagine the Siri that we have now or the Alexa that we have now. When we ask questions, these devices speak, right? Even though they are not human. So if the devices can speak, something which doesn't even have life to them, imagine it's not difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our limbs speak. They will speak, be even in law, either for us or against us. But the irony of that day would be that our mouths will be sealed up. We'll not be able to defend ourselves no matter how hard we try. So it's going to be a moment of hasra, a moment of regret because we'll not be able to help ourselves. And if it had been our will, we would surely have wiped out, blinded their eyes so that they would struggle for the path. How then would they see? And if it had been our will, we could have transformed them in their own places. We could have made them lifeless objects. Then they would have been unable to go forward, nor they could have turned back. SubhanAllah. If you look at the Iman of, of the Sahaba, like if you see Abu Bakr, anh, he used to say, Oh bird, how lucky you are, how fortunate you are. You eat and drink and you fly under the shade of trees and you have no fear of the reckoning of the day of judgment. I wish that I was like you. Imagine who's saying that. It's not me who's saying that. It's not you who's saying that. It is Abu Bakr who's saying that he wishes to be a bird because he fears the day of judgment. He fears the day of Qiyamah. The person who was given the bashara of Jannah within his life. From who? From the mouth of the Prophet. 
He was given the glad tiding of Jannah, yet he is making this wish because he fears the day of Qiyamah. And here we are, and we think that the day of Qiyamah is not even going to come. It's something which is far off. SubhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. I number 68, and he whom we grant long life, we reverse him in creation. Will they not understand? Meaning we go back to the weakness that we have when we were born. We go back to that dependency that we had when we were born. And we have not taught him, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a shi'ar, poetry. Nor is it suitable for him. That is only a reminder and a plain Quran. Meaning this Quran is not poetry that is supposed to be just recited with beautification. This Quran has come for hidayah. It is a vikr. It is a reminder for us. It's not only to be recited with beautiful voices, but the haqq of Quran is also that we read it, we study it, and we apply it, we follow it. That he, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may give warning to him who is living, and that word charge may be justified against the disbelievers. And again, this ayah is also a proof within Surah Yasin that this Quran, liyun biraman kana hayya, this Quran is for the living, not for the dead. So we should benefit from it. Do they not see that we have created for them of what our hands have created, the cattle, so that they are their owners and we have subdued them to them so that some of them they have for writing and some they eat and they have other benefits from them and they get milk to drink. Will they not then be grateful? And they have taken besides Allah, God's hoping that they might be helped. They cannot help them, but they will be brought forward as a troop against those who worship them. So let not their speech then grieve you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Verily, we know what they conceal and what they reveal. Does not man see that we have created him from a nutfa, a mixed drop? Yet behold, he stands forth as an open opponent, Khasim al Rabin. And he puts forth for us a parable and forgets his own creation. He says, Who will give life to these bones after they are rotted and have become dust? Say, O Muhammad, وسلم, he will give life to them who created them for the first time. And he is all knower of every creation. He who produces for you fire out of green tree, when behold, you kindle therewith, is not he who created the heavens and the earth able to create the like of them? Yes, indeed, he is the all-knowing supreme creator. Verily, his command when he intends a thing is only that he says it to be be, and it is. Kun fayakun. So glorified is he in whose hand is the dominion of all things and to him you shall be returned. So alhamdulillah, that's the conclusion of Surah Yasin, a beautiful surah, subhanAllah, the heart of Quran. And now we will begin with Surah Safat, another beautiful surah, subhanAllah, filled with beautiful lessons and reminders. So let us listen to the recitation of this surah. Okay, let us begin. Surah Safat. Surah Safat is also a Makki Surah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off the Surah by saying, Wasafati Safa. By those angels ranged in ranks or rows. By those angels who drive the clouds in a good way. By those angels who bring the book and the Quran from Allah to mankind. So over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes a qasam of the angels who are ranged in rows, who are formed in rows. So what is their premium quality? What is their supreme attribute that they 
form rows. They stand in rows in the presence of Allah. And the Sahaba, they asked this question to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They said, how do the Malaika stand in rows in the presence of their Rabb? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, they make the first row complete and they keep close together in their rows. So we should apply this in our life. Take heed, take a lesson from these malaika, these angels, that whenever we go to the masjid and pray salah behind the imam, we have to make sure that we keep our rows straight. We have to make sure that we try to complete the first row before we form another one. We shouldn't have random groups of people standing here and there scattered. We have to form rows because this is the sunnah of the angels. And in it is a lesson for us. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, keep your rows straight because your rows resemble those of the malaika. Join the shoulders and fill the gap between yourselves and be gentle and soft in the hands of your brothers. SubhanAllah, Allah is teaching us to learn from the angels how to pray con congregational salah. Many a times we try to form our own private spot just because there's a fan over there or just because it's the corner of the room so that we can have backrest. And we totally neglect the fact that we should form a con one complete line, one complete row. So let us learn from the sunnah of the angels that this is something which is recommended, which is preferred in the eyes of Allah, that we all stand together as one Muslim family, as one ummah, shoulder to shoulder, praying together. What are some other etiquettes of congregational salah in masjid? Another etiquette that we learn is the fact that we should be careful not to offend our fellow companions because of our odor that may be coming out of our clothes or some kind of offensive odor that would harm them in their salah. So we have to make sure that we wear clean clothes. Um, SubhanAllah, our, our mouth doesn't smell like ginger and garlic. Uh, SubhanAllah, because this is something which is, you know, um, uh, offensive to the malaika that um, you know our mouths have odor coming from it so we have to make sure that we are pleasant when we stand next to our sisters in the congregational sala and we do not harm them in any way shape or form when we are praying behind the imam another etiquette is that we have to follow the imam we cannot precede him while doing ruku or sujood we have to follow him, insha'Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the oath by these malaika, by these angels to say what? Because every time Allah takes an oath, there is a purpose to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to say something which is very important. So what is the most important thing Allah mentions in ayah number four? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna ilahakum lawahid. Verity or God is indeed one. The Lord of the heavens and the earth and all that is between them, and the Lord of every point of the sun's rising. Verily, we have adorned the near heaven with the stars for beauty, and to guard against every rebellious devil. They cannot listen to the higher group angels, for they are pelted from every side. Outcast, and theirs is the constant torment, Except such who snatch away something by stealing, and they are pursued by a flaming fire of piercing brightness, meaning the devils who try to snatch away some information about the qadr from the malaika. What happens to them? They are pursued by a flaming fire. Then ask them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are they stronger as creation or those whom we have created? Verily, we created them of a sticky clay. Meaning that's our reality. That's the real basis of our creation, that we are create, created from clean and lazib, from sticky clay. Does anyone of us like sticky clay? 
honestly, it's pretty annoying because it keeps sticking to our fingers, right? It's not like nice, fresh Play-Doh. It's not like that. So we are created from something which is so sticky. Then how can we imagine, subhanAllah, that once we grow up, once we are powerful, once we have authority, we become all of a sudden so arrogant, so boastful, and belittle others? No. Our creation is from Queen al -Lazim, So we should be humble. That's our basis. That's our foundation. No, you are Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wondered at their insolence while they mock at you. And when they are reminded, they pay no attention. وَإِذَا ذُكِرُوا لَا يَذْكُرُونَ Quran is recited to them, but they have no time for it. They don't pay any attention to it. And when they see an ayah from Allah, they mock at it. They make fun of it. And they say, this is nothing but evident magic. When we are dead and have become dust and bones, shall we then be resurrected? And also our fathers of all, meaning how come people who died centuries ago, how can they be resurrected? Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yes, and you shall then be humiliated. Meaning the people who reject Allah, they will be re resurrected for sure. But then they will be humiliated. It will be a single zajra, a single shout. And behold, they will be staring. They will say, woe to us. This is the day of recompense. They will realize it. That, oh my God, the day of Qiyamah that we used to hear from our prophet, it has come now. The day of Qiyamah that we often used to learn about, study about in the Quran, that has finally come. It will be said, this is the day of judgment which you used to deny. It will be said, assemble those who did wrong together with their companions from the devils and what they used to worship. Meaning, the command will be given to the malaika, to the angels, to gather everyone together, the ones who did wrong. Instead of Allah, they worshipped and lead them on the way of flaming fire. But stop them, verily, they are to be questioned. Meaning, we, we will be assembled and then waqifuhum, innahum mas'ulun. We will be stopped for accountability. What is the matter with you? Why do you not help one another? No, but that day they shall surrender. Meaning if we refuse to surrender ourselves to Allah right now, definitely in the day on the day of Qiyamah, we will be forced to surrender. And they will turn to one another and question one another. They will say, it was you who used to come to us from the right side. They will reply, no, you yourselves were not believers. And we had no authority over you. No, but you were transgressing people. In dunya, when two siblings have a fight, or husband and wife, they go through a marital discord, and the guilt is established. How does it feel like? When we're trying to defend ourselves, we keep arguing and arguing, and someone tells us, that's it. We know that it's your fault. We know it's you. It's all you who is guilty. How does it feel like? It really hurts. Honestly, it really hurts. It's painful because we cannot do anything to change it. We know we're guilty, but we cannot change anything. So if in dunya it feels so bad, even though we have a chance to repent, then imagine the regret on the day of Qiyamah when there will be no apologies accepted, when there will be no second chances given. So Allah subhanahu wa says, I number 31, فَحَقَّ عَلَيْنَا قَوْلُ رَبِّنَا إِنَّا لَذَائِقُونَ So now the word of our Lord has been justified against us that we shall certainly have taste the torment. So we led you astray because we were ourselves astray. Then verily that day they will all share in the torment. Meaning the one who misled others and the ones who followed them. Certainly this is how we deal with the criminals. Truly when it was said to them, La ilaha illallah, they purified, they puffed themselves up with the pride and denied it. Yes, takbirun. 
And they said, are we going to abandon our gods for the sake of a mad poet? No way. He, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has come with the truth. And he confirms the messengers. Verily, you are going to taste the painful torment. And you will be recruited for nothing except for what you used to do. Meaning, you're not going to be given any extra azab, any bonus azab. It's all what you used to do. Those are your actions. That's what you will be held accountable for. Because Allah is Adam. He doesn't do injustice with anyone. However, who are the people of exception? The ones who will not be tormented, the ones who will not be punished. Except the chosen ones of Allah. They will be saved. For them, there will be a known provision in Jannah. Fruits. And they shall be honored. If you look at the word faqihun and fawaki, both have the same root word, right? Fakaha, which means to make someone happy. So the fruits of Jannah are going to be as such that they are going to make us happy. We're going to be pleased eating them and even looking at them. Just to look at them would be a sight to please us. Fi jannatin na'im, in the gardens of delight, in Jannah, facing one another on thrones. Round them will be passed a cup of pure wine, white, delicious to the drinkers. Neither will they have any kind of hurt from that, nor will they suffer any kind of intoxication. <sighs> Subhanallah, over here again we learned that the cup of wine that was made haram for the people in dunya, because wine, alcohol, literally has side effects for our body. So on that day, because we stayed away from it, because we refrained from it, on that day in Jannah, we will be given wine. How? Ka'as is a cup overflowing with drink. SubhanAllah, if you have seen those, those fountain um, drinks, it's so beautiful to see that the, the drink is literally overflowing from the jug. And there are servers who pour them in the cups. So that's going to be the site of Jannah. And that wine in Jannah is going to be something which is going to have taste, which is going to have premium quality to it, but no intoxication, no side effects. And then what else would they get? Beside them will be chaste female wives. Restraining their glances, desiring none except their husbands with wide and beautiful eyes. Delicate and pure, as if they were hidden eggs, well preserved. That would be, subhanAllah, us, the wives, we will be beautiful as Qasirat al -tarf. The spouse in Jannah, they will be given the beauty of Yusuf alayhi salam. So each one of us, inshallah, if we make it to Jannah, inshallah, ameen. Allahumma ja'ala minhum. That is the kind of beauty we will be given in Jannah. Then they will turn to one another, mutually questioning. A speaker of them will say, verily, I had a companion in the world. So imagine that you and your husband, you're talking to each other. You are reclining in your thrones, drinking a cup of wine, and then you're talking to each other. And you're going to say, verily, in dunya, I had a friend who used to say, are you among those who believe? Meaning, do you believe in resurrection? That when we die and become dust and bones, shall we indeed be raised up to receive reward or punishment? Meaning he used to express amazement that really is not going to happen. So they're going to be questioning each other. I wonder where is that friend of mine who did not believe in resurrection, who did not believe in the day of judgment? The speaker said, will you look down? Meaning he will be told, you're going to be told, or your husband is going to be told, look down. Do you wish to see an acquaintance of yours? So despite the fact that you are in Jannah, you will have access to look at the people of Jahannam. So I number 55, So he looked down and saw him in the midst of fire. Allahu Akbar. 
you're going to see this person who rejected Qiyama, who rejected hereafter, he's going to be in the midst of fire. He said, by Allah, you have nearly ruined me. So at that site, when you are in Jannah and you're looking at this friend of yours who's deep down in Jahannam, you're going to say, what? Tallahi in kitta laturbeen. Oh my God, you had nearly ruined me. Meaning the companionship that we had, that we shared in dunya, you always used to inflict evil pressure on me. The negative peer pressure I used to always face in dunya, but I'm happy that I'm saved. Alhamdulillah, I never listened to you. I'm glad that I made it to Jannah. So you're going to say, Tallahi in kitta laturbeen. Had it not been for the grace of my Lord, I would certainly have been among those brought forth to hell. So you're going to be thankful in Jannah that thank God I did not listen to my friend. Otherwise, I would have ended up in Jahannam because our friends, they have an effect on us. They create an impact on our hearts. So let us choose our friends wisely. The dwellers of Jannah will say, are we then not to die anymore? So now, subhanAllah, after that scene is over, you are sitting with your husband, with your family members, with your parents, enjoying yourselves. And a thought is going to come to your mind that, wow, this is so much fun. But the question is, are we going to die? Is there going to be a point when all this fun is going to end? All this pleasure is going to end? Because that was the case in dunya. So you're going to question, are we then not to die anymore? Will we not die? Accept our first death and we shall not be punished? Truly, this is supreme success. Meaning you're going to be so happy that, alhamdulillah, there's no end to it. Alhamdulillah, there's no death to it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives this teaser to us of Jannah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, فَلْيَعْمَلِلْعَمِلُونَ if you want the like of this, let the workers work. Meaning if you wish to have these delights, these pleasures, then what should you do? You should work for it. You should try to earn it. So Allah subhanahu wa says, is that a jannah, better entertainment, or the tree of zakum? And what is zakum? It is a tree in Jahannam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if one drop of the tree of Zakum were to fall down on earth, it would make the lives of the dwellers of the earth bitter. So what do you think of the one for whom there is no food except for Zakum? That's the food for the inhabitants of Jahannam. Astaghfirullah. Truly, we have made it as a trial for the wrongdoers. Verily, it is a tree that springs out of the bottom of hellfire. The shoots of its fruit stalks are like the heads of shayateen. Truly, they will eat thereof and fill their bellies therewith. Meaning they will have no choice. So they'll have to eat it. They'll be forced to eat it. Something which is bitter to taste and something which is horrible to see. Because the shoots of his fruit stalks will be like the head of shayateen. And in dunya, we're, we're so scared of shayateen, right? We're always apprehensive to see a jinn. So the appearance of that tree and the taste of the fruits, all that will be very, very horrific. Then on the day, on top of that, they will be given boiling water to drink so that it becomes a mixture of boiling water and zakum in their bellies. And then after, barely their return is to the flaming fire of Jahannam. Meaning, when they would be so harmed eating that tree, eating that fruit of the tree, even the drink will not be able to suffice them because the drink would be boiling water. And on top of that, the fire will surround them. Internal and external pain. Verily, they found their fathers on the wrong path. So they too hastened in their footsteps. And indeed, most of the men of old went astray before them. And indeed, we sent among them warners, messengers. Then see, what was the end of those who were warned? Except the chosen ones. Illa ibadallahi al The chosen slaves of Allah. 
And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to be from the mukhlasin. Um, and indeed, Nuh invoked us. And we are the best of those who answer. And we rescued him and his family from the great distress. And his progeny, them, we made them the survivors. The survivors and left for him a goodly remembrance among the later generations. Salam, peace be upon Nuh, among the alameen. Verily, thus we reward the muhsineen. Verily, he, Nuh, was one of our believing slaves. Then we drowned the others, the disbelievers and the criminals, and verily among those who followed his way, the way of Nuh, alayhi salam, was Ibrahim. So meaning Ibrahim alayhi salam came from the generation of Nuh alayhi salam. When he came to his rob with a pure heart, when he said to his father and to his people, what is it that you worship? Is it a falsehood, gods, other than Allah that you desire? Then what do you think about the Lord of the Alameen? So he is giving da'wah to the people of his nation. So what does he do? He uses a strategy. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Then he cast a glance at the stars. And he said, Verily, I am sick. And he did this trick to remain in their temple so that when the people have departed, he's able to destroy the idols. So this was just a strategy of da'wah. He made an excuse. He said, I'm sick. What basically meant, what basically he meant was that I'm sick with your shirk. I'm sick with your kufr. I just cannot take it anymore. So he said, I'm sick. So they turned away from him and departed for fear of the disease. Then he turned to their gods, meaning Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he turned to their idols and he said, will you not eat of the offspring before you? Meaning the offering that is presented to you from the people, your followers, aren't you going to eat this? What is the matter with you that you do not speak? Then he turned upon them, striking them with his right hand. Meaning he broke them. But no one, none of the idols were able to defend themselves. Then what happened? They, the worshippers of idols, came towards him, hastening. He said, do you worship that which you yourselves carve? Meaning how do you worship this? This is something you made out of your own hands. How can this be a God? It's not possible. While Allah has created you and what you make. So they said, build for him a building. It is said that the building was like a furnace and throw him into a blazing fire. So they plotted against him, but we made them the lowest. And he said, after this rescue from the fire, verily I am going to my Lord. He will guide me. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he wasn't, punished, he wasn't scared of their threat. He said, Verily, Allah will guide me. My Lord, grant me from the righteous. Rabbi habli min as salihin. Immediately, Ibrahim alayhi salam thought to himself, It's okay even if I'm not alive. Ya Allah, grant me a child who is righteous, who's able to take my legacy forward, who can inherit prophethood from me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I number 101. So we gave him the glad tidings of a forbearing boy. Meaning not just a boy, but a boy who was halim. Very patient, very forbearing. And it said that when Ibrahim alayhi salam had the son, he was around 86 years old. And when he, his son, was old enough to walk with him, he said, oh my son, I have seen in a dream that I'm slaughtering you. Meaning, subhanAllah, he had this son at the age of 86. And then many years have passed, subhanAllah, because Ibrahim alayhi salam was commanded to leave Ismail alayhi salam, his son, and his wife Hajra in a deserted place in Mecca. So he left them. And then many years have passed. The scenes have been fast, fast forwarded. And now, after many decades have passed, now, this father and a son, they're having a meeting together. And Ibrahim alayhi salam tells his son, Ismail alayhi salam, that I have seen in my dream that I'm slaughtering you. So what do you think about it? 
He said, oh, my father, do that which you are commanded. Inshallah, if Allah wills, you will find me from the patient ones. SubhanAllah. We see over here that the wahi, the dreams that we see, um, the dreams that the prophets see, they are actually a mode of wahi for them. They're a mode of revelation to them. So whatever dreams they see, they're basically commands to them. So in this ayah, ayah number 102, Ibrahim salam was basically commanded by Allah to sacrifice his son for the sake of Allah. Ibrahim salam doesn't just carry out that order. What does he do first? He takes mashwara. He consults his son. He talks to him about it. What do you think? But subhanAllah, this is the son of a prophet and he's a prophet himself. SubhanAllah, his response is no less than the response of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So he says, you can do what you are commanded. Ya abati, if'al ma tu'mar. So tajiduni insha'allahu min sabirin You're going to find me patient, insha'Allah. Meaning I'm not boastful about it. I'm not confident about it. Insha'Allah, if Allah wills, I will be patient. Meaning I'm going to try my best. Then when they had both submitted themselves to the will of Allah and he had laid him prostrating on his forehead, we called out to him, O oh Ibrahim, you have fulfilled the dream. Verily, thus do we reward the good doers. So subhanAllah, this was basically a trial for Ibrahim salam, whether he fulfills the command or not. But when they both were ready to enact on this plan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically replaced Ismail alayhi salam with a goat, with a sheep, and that was a sacrifice that Ibrahim alayhi salam made. And his son was safe. Ismail alayhi salam was left untouched. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is how we reward the muhsinin, the people who do ihsan. And yes, it happens with all of us that sometimes we are tested and it's a very heavy trial. It's a very heavy calamity. But once we pass the test, then inshallah, what's the reward? Kadalika najusil muhsinin. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us ample for our ihsan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I number 106, verily that indeed was a manifest trial. Inna hada lahu al bala'ul mubin. Sacrificing your own child is not something easy, right? So even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledges the fact that it was a very difficult test. And we ransomed him with a great sacrifice, with a ram, and we left for him a goodly remembrance among the later generations. Salam, peace be upon Ibrahim. Thus do we reward the muhsineen, meaning if we do good, if we practice ihsan with other people in dunya, then what happens? What's the reward? Not just the fact that we will be given Jannah, insha'Allah. Another reward it is, وَتَرَكْنَا عَلَيْهِ فِي الْآخِرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves a goodly remembrance about us in the hearts of other people, even though we're long dead and gone. People remember us with good works. We are mentioned with good names. Why is this important? Because this good remembrance is going to act as a hujja for us on the day of Qiyamah. So we definitely need all these good testimonials. On the day of Qiyamah, we definitely need these witnesses for us and not against us, inshallah. I number 112. And we gave him the glad tidings of Ishaq, a prophet from the righteous. So at the age of 99, Ibrahim alayhi salam was given another son, Ishaq alayhi salam, Isaac. We blessed him and Isaac, and of their progeny are some that do right and some that plainly wrong themselves. Meaning from their zuriyah, from their generations, there were people who were righteous and there were people who were sinners. And indeed, we gave our grace to Musa and Harun, and we saved them and their people from the great distress and helped them so that they become victorious. 
And we gave them the clear scripture and guided them to the right path. And we left for them a good remembrance among the later generations. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to have good remembrance after we die in the hearts of people. Salam, peace be upon Musa and Harun. Verily, thus do we reward the good doers. Verily, they were two of our believing slaves. And verily, Ilyas was one of the messengers. When he said to his people, will you not fear Allah? Will you not call upon Baal? And Baal was a well-known idol of his nation. Will you not forsake? Will you call upon Baal and forsake the best of creators? Allah Rabbakum wa Rabba Aba'ikum al awwaleen Allah is your Lord and the Lord of your forefathers. But they denied him. So they will certainly be brought forth to the punishment. Except illa ibad Allah al Except the chosen slaves of Allah. And we left for him among the later generations a good remembrance. Salam, peace be upon Ilyas. Verily he was amongst the good doers. Verily, he was one of our believing slaves. And verily, Lut was one of the messengers when we saved him and his family all together, except an old woman, Ajuzan fil Ghabirin, who was among those who remained behind. Then we destroyed the rest. Verily, you pass by them in the morning and at night. Will you not then reflect? Meaning the people of Mecca would actually pass by the area where the nation of Lut salam, was destroying. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, la tamuruna, you pass by them in the morning and in the night, would you not then reflect? Would you not think about the fact of why they were destroyed? So anytime we come upon the remnants of the nations who were destroyed, it should lead us towards reflection. It shouldn't be just merely taking pictures and saving our great memories and sharing it with others. It should lead, take, it should lead us towards reflection. And verily, Yunus was one of the messengers. When he ran to the laden ship, then he agreed to cast lots and he was among the losers. Then a big fish swallowed him as he had done an act worthy of blame. So what was this act worthy of blame? We come to know, subhanAllah, what was the sin of Yunus salam? The lesson comes full circle when we realize what happened to the people of his town, Nineveh after Yunus alayhi salam left them. And what was his mistake? That even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given the nation three days before they were given the ultimatum of being destroyed, before the three days had lapsed, Yunus alayhi salam gave up on his people and he left them. He left the people and he went to the sea. He deserted them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what happened when he was in that ship, when he had left his people, a huge storm struck the ship. And the people started casting lots as to who can we throw out from the ship because the ship is going to turn over and everyone will be drowned. So someone needs to be thrown in the water. So they cast lots. And every time with the izin of Allah, the name of Yunus salam, was pulled out. So then he was thrown in the water and a big fish swallowed him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, had he not been, had he not been of them who glorify Allah, he would have indeed remained inside the belly of the fish till the day of resurrection. So what is the quality that is highlighted over here of Yunus alayhi salam? فَلَوْلَ أَنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُسَبِّحِينَ If he was not from the people who remembered Allah, glorified Allah, do the dhikr of Allah, then he would have been in the belly of the fish till the day of Qiyam. So what should we do? We should moisten our tongues with dhikr because it can protect us from the punishment of Allah. It can protect us from calamities. So what happened, subhanAllah? Meanwhile, all this happened. His people, his nation, they started seeing dark clouds and they became terrified. 
So they started to beg Allah for forgiveness. The entire nation started begging Allah for forgiveness. And they plead with Allah. They pleaded with Allah not to curse them. So what happened? Allah forgave them. SubhanAllah. You can see two scenes being mentioned to us side by side. Just like how SubhanAllah in the modern movies of today, they show us two scenes of two different places side by side. So a dramatic scene is presented to us. But meanwhile, Yunus alayhi salam is making dua in the belly of the fish, in the belly of the whale, saying, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min He's seeking forgiveness. Meanwhile, side by side, his entire nation is seeking the forgiveness of Allah in the city of Nineveh. And what happened, subhanAllah, all of them are forgiven. Allah forgives the nation. And of course, Allah forgives his prophet. So what happened? We cast him forth on the naked shore while he was sick. So what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the repentance of Yunus alayhi salam and the fish threw him out near the shore. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in a state that he was wahua thaqeen, he was sick. Why was he sick? Because it's mentioned that when he was inside the whale's stomach, the acids of the whale's stomach actually made his skin to peel off. The condition of his skin worsened because of those acids. So he suffered intensely. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala landed him to the shore and under that, subhanAllah, there was a fig tree which was there where his life was saved. Imagine a prophet, subhanAllah, going through all this. But did he lose hope? Did he go in despair? No. He kept praying to Allah and Allah accepted his dua. Allah forgave him. What do we learn from here? That as believers, no matter how many sins we have committed in the past, how huge was the intensity of our sins, we should never lose hope. We should never despair because Allah is all forgiving. So what should we do? We should seek repentance and reform, correct our ways, correct our actions. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 146, and we caused a plant of gourd to grow over him. And we sent him to 100,000 people or even more. And they believed. So we gave them enjoyment for a while. Now ask them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are there only daughters for your Lord and sons for them? So now general address is being given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because the people of Makkah would believe that the malaika, the angels, are basically the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah tells the Prophet to ask them that do you think that Allah has daughters while you are proud because you have sons? Or did we create the angels female while they were witnesses? Allah is questioning, how do you know that the angels are in fact females? Where did you get that information? What's the authentication for that? Verily, it is of their falsehood that they say that Allah has begotten an offspring and verily they are liars. Meaning this is just their false made up fabrication. There's no truth to the fact that angels are females and there's no truth to the fact that Allah has any offspring. Has he then chosen daughters rather than sons? What is the matter with you? How do you decide? Will you not then remember? Or is there for you a plain authority? Then bring your book if you're truthful. And they have invented a kinship between him and the jinn, but the jinn know well that they have indeed to appear before him. So what's the, the background of this ayah is that when the people of Bakka would say that the angels are the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu would ask as a rhetorical question, okay, fine, if that's true, then who are their mothers? Where's the mother of those daughters? So the people would respond that the daughters of the leaders of jinns are their mothers. So subhanAllah, it was a really made up fabricated religion. 
So Allah subhanahu wa says, how have you invented a kinship between Allah and the jinn? How is it even possible? Subhanallah, amna yasifun. Glorified is Allah. He's free from whatever they attribute to him. Illa ibadallah al Except the slaves of Allah, whom he chooses. So verily you pagans and those whom you worship idols cannot lead astray any one of the believers, except those who are predestined to burn in hell. And there is not one of us angels, but has its known place or position. And verily we, the angels, stand in rows for prayers. This surah is named as safar So again, repeatedly in the beginning of the surah and in the conclusion of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that the angels, they stand saf in rows. And verily the angels indeed are those who glorify Allah. So another quality of the angel is that they're always remembering Allah. We should ask ourselves, how much do we remember Allah? And indeed, they, the pagans, used to say, if we had a reminder, as had the men of old, we would have indeed been the chosen slaves of Allah. But now that the Quran has come, they disbelieve therein. So they will come to know. And verily, our word has gone forth of old for our slaves, the messengers, that they verily would be made successful and that our hosts, they verily would be victorious. So turn away, O Muhammad, from them for a while and watch them and they shall see the punishment. Meaning, as a prophet, you cannot force them. Give them da'wah, tell them, advise them, admonish them. But then after that, turn away from them and just watch them. Give them some time. See if they take heed, if they benefit from the Quran. Do they seek to hasten on our torment? Then when it descends in their courtyard near to them, evil will be the morning for those who had been warned. Meaning when the punishment comes, they are surely going to be regretful. So turn away from them for a while, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and watch and they shall see the torment. Subhana rabbika rabbil isati anna yasifun. Glorified is your Lord, the Lord of our honor and power. He is free from what they attribute to him. Wassalamun ala al and peace be on all the messengers. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. And all praise and thanks are to Allah, the Lord of the alameen. SubhanAllah, what a beautiful, powerful conclusion of this surah, Surah Safa. Let us uh, begin Surah Sad, another Makki Surah, another beautiful Surah. So let's listen to the recitation of this Surah. Rahman Rahim Sad, Wal Quran Zil Zikr, Bani Ladina Kafaru Fi Izzatin Wa Shikaq. Kam Ahlakna Min Qabrihim Min Qarmin it begins with Saad. By the Quran, full of reminding. So here the promise is taken from the Quran with the name of Quran. No, those who disbelieve are in false pride and opposition. How many a generation have we destroyed before them? And they cried out when there was no longer time for escape. And they wonder that a warner has come to them from among themselves. And the disbelievers say, this Prophet Muhammad is a sorcerer. He's a liar. Has he made the gods all into one ilah? Meaning, how is it possible that all the deities, all the idols that we have, they're all just transformed into one? How is it even possible? Verily, this is a curious thing. In the hadal al-shay'un ujab. And the leaders among them went about saying, go on and remain constant to your gods. Verily, this is a thing designed against you. We have not heard the like of this in the religion of these later days. This is nothing but an invention. Meaning we have never heard about one God from our previous forefathers. So this is just, it's just something recently done. It's an invention. Has the reminder been sent down to him alone from among us? No, but they are in doubt about my reminder. No, but they have not tasted my torment. Or have they the treasures of the mercy of your Lord, the almighty, the real bestower? 
Or is it that the dominion of the heavens and the earth and all that is between them is theirs? If so, let them ascend up with means to the heavens as they denied Allah and his message. They will be defeated host like the confederates of the old times. I number 12. Before them were many who denied messengers, the people of Nuh and Ad and Fir'aun, the man of stakes, with which he used to punish the people. And Thamud and the people of Luth and the dwellers of the wood, such were the confederates. Not one of them but denied the messengers, therefore my torment was justified. And these only wait for a single shout. There will be no pause or ending thereto. They say, our Lord, hasten to us the qittana, a record of deed, before the day of reckoning. Be patient, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of what they say. And remember our slave Da'ud alayhi salam, endued with power. Verily, he was ever after returning in all matters and in repentance. So one of the highlights of Da'ud alayhi salam is the fact that he was abdana Dawuda. He was someone who would often return to Allah in repentance. He would make a lot of istighfar. So I number 17 teaches us one of the beautiful character traits of Da'ud alayhi salam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned something about the lifestyle of Da'ud alayhi salam. How did he live? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informs us that the most beautiful, beloved of prayer to Allah is the prayer of Da'ud alayhi salam. And the most beloved of fasting to Allah is the fasting of Da'ud alayhi salam. So we may wonder, okay, fine, what, how would he fast? How would he pray? Well, we're curious to know. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he used to sleep for half of the night. Stand in prayer for a third of the night and then sleep for a sixth of a night. And subhanAllah, um, getting up 10 minutes before Fajr and praying Tahajjud is far easier than waking up in the middle of the night, praying Qiyamul Layl, going back to sleep, and then again waking up for Fajr. It's actually very tough. So this is something that Awud alayhi salam would do. And then how would he fast? He used to fast on alternate days. SubhanAllah. So all year round, how would he fast? He would fast on alternate days. He would fast on one day and then skip another day. And then that would be his routine for his entire life. SubhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledges his efforts and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him innahu awab. So if we want our efforts to be acknowledged on the day of Fiyana, what should we do? We should try to follow the sunnah of our prophets as much as we can. Verily, we made the mountains to glorify our praises with him in the midday till the sunset and in the time of Ishraq, after sunrise till midday. And so did the birds assembled, all obedient to him. They would come and glorify the praises of Allah with Dawud alayhi salam. We made his kingdom strong and gave him hikmah, prophethood, and sound judgment in speech and decision. And has the news of the litigants reached you when they climbed over the wall into his mihrab. When they entered in upon Da'ud, he was terrified of them. They said, fear not. We are two litigants, one of whom has wronged the other, therefore judge between us with truth and treat us not with injustice and guide us to the right way. Verily this, my brother in religion has 99 you, while I have only one you, and he says, hand it over to me, and he, and he overpowered me in speech. Dawud alayhi salam said, he has wronged you in demanding your you, in addition to his use, and verily many partners oppress one another, except those who believe and do righteous good deeds, and they are few. And Dawud alayhi salam guessed that we have tested him, and he sought forgiveness of his Rabb, and he fell down in prostration and turned to Allah in repentance. So over here, uh, uh, we see that Da'ud alayhi salam was tested through an incident. And subhanAllah, he realized that the judgment that he has made, he has messed up 
in bad judgment. So as soon as he realized his mistake, he immediately fell down in prostration. He immediately became busy with prayer. And that is the sunnah of the righteous people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there is no one who commits a sin, then purifies himself well, meaning if someone has committed a sin, then they should do wudu, stand and pray two rakah and ask Allah for forgiveness. And Allah will forgive him. SubhanAllah. So over here, Salatul Tawbah is mentioned. But when we want to seek sincere repentance, this is something which we can incorporate, that we can do. Sheikh Ibn Islam, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he used to say that this prayer, subhanAllah, Salatul Tawbah, is something which can also be done when prayer is not recommended. Meaning, after Asr, when prayer is not recommended, you can still do Salatul Tawbah. Because repentance doesn't have a time. As soon as we acknowledge our sin, we should immediately repent. So what happened? So we forgave him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave that with alayhi salam. That and verily for him is a near access to us and a good place of final return. O Dawood, verily we have placed you as a successor on the earth. So you judge between men and truth and follow not your desire for it will mislead you from the path of Allah. So what do we learn from here? That some of our desires, they are not good. They mislead us from the right path. So whatever we wish, it shouldn't be accomplished. It shouldn't be achieved because some of our desires mislead us from the right path. Verily, those who wander astray from the path of Allah have a severe torment because they forgot the day of reckoning. And um, subhanAllah, just a quick note, a reminder that I number 24 has sajda tilawa. So after um, we're done with our class, please make sure to do this sajda, sajda tilawa. I number 27, and we created not the heaven and the earth and all that is between them without purpose. That is the consideration of those who disbelieve. Then woe to those who disbelieve from the fire. Shall we treat those who believe and do righteous good deeds as, as mufsidin, as those who corrupt them, uh, as those who cause corruption on earth? Or shall we treat the pious as the fujar, as the people who are sinners? Meaning it's not befitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to judge the righteous ones same as the ones who are corrupt. To present the same judgment, pass the same judgment that he presents for the muttaqin and Allah gives it for the fujah, for the criminals. It's not possible. So the people who pray and the people who do not pray, they're not the same. The people who study the Qur'an benefit from the Qur'an and the ones who do not do that, they're not the same. The children who are obedient to their parents and the ones who are not, they're not the same. The ones who give sadaqah in the way of Allah and the ones who are stingy and miserly, they're not the same. Each one of them will be judged according to their actions. This is a book, the Quran, which we have sent down to you full of blessings that they may ponder over its ayat and that the men of understanding may remember. And to that old we gave Suleiman, Solomon, how excellent a slave was he. Verily, he was ever oft repenting in repentance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledges his son, Suleiman alayhi salam, that even he got the same attribute as his father, innahu awad, same attribute is mentioned, which tells us what? That if as parents, we lead a good legacy, we become a good trendsetter, then inshallah, our children, they are like sponges. They absorb everything that is going on around them. Their minds are like sponges. So if we set a good example for them, then inshallah, they're going to follow our footsteps. But say, for instance, if we do not pray, if we do not fast in the month of Ramadan, if we ourselves are not obedient to our parents, how do we think that our children can automatically turn up, grow up to become righteous? It doesn't work like that. So as parents, we have this heavy responsibility on our shoulders that we set a good example for our children so that our children can set a good example for their children. And that's how 
the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will nourish, inshaAllah. When there were displayed before him in the afternoon, well-trained horses of the highest breed, he said, I did love the good, these horses, instead of remembering my Lord, till the time was over and the sun had hidden in the veil of night. Meaning that Prophet, Prophet Sulaiman got so busy looking at his beautiful horses that the time of Asr Salah lapsed. Meaning he became late for his Salah. So what happened? Then he said, bring them, the horses, back to me. Then he passed. Then he began to pass his hand over their legs and their necks. And indeed, we did try Sulaiman alayhi salam. And we placed on his throne a jasad. And he did return to Allah with obedience and repentance and to his throne and the kingdom by his grace. He said, O oh my Lord, forgive me and bestow upon me a kingdom such as shall not belong to any other after me. Verily, you are the bestower. So over here, subhanAllah, we see that even Suleiman alayhi salam, even he was tested. Even he was tested. But as soon as he realized that he has actually preferred the gl glitter of this dunya over the akhirah, meaning he preferred his horses and because of them, his salah was delayed. He immediately fell down in repentance. He immediately asked Allah for forgiveness. So again, we all make mistakes. No matter how much Quran we have studied, no matter how many salawat we pray, how many fasts we do, we all mess up. So what should we do? We should continue to ask Allah for forgiveness. Rabbil firli wa habli min Ya Allah, um, forgive us and make us righteous. We should ask for forgiveness for ourselves, our children, and all the mu'mineen. And then what else did Suleiman alayhi salam say? Suleiman alayhi salam made dua that, Ya Allah, bestow upon me a kingdom that is not granted to anyone. It is unique. And subhanAllah, his dua was granted. His du'a was given to him and the kind of kingdom he was given, subhanAllah, no one after him was able to have that privilege because he had a unique kingdom. He had control over the wind, the animals, the jinns, and the humans. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so we subjected to him the wind. It blew gently by his order wherever it willed, wherever he willed. And also the shayateen, every kind of builder and diver, meaning the shayateen would build buildings for him on his orders, and they would dive in the ocean to receive the coral. So they would work for him endlessly based upon his orders. And also others bound in fetters, meaning there were other jinns who were controlled by Suleiman alayhi salam. Allah said to Solomon, this is our gift. So you spend or withhold, no account will be asked of you. Meaning however you wish to use these jinns for your service, you can do that. You are permitted to do that. But for us, we cannot seek the help of shayateen. We cannot try to access the jinns. And verily for him is a near access to us and a good final return. And remember our slave Ayyub, when he invoked his Lord, saying, Verily, Shaitan has touched me with distress by ruining my health and torment by ruining my wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, Strike the ground with your foot. This is a spring of water to wash in, cool and a refreshing drink. And we gave him back his family and along with them the like thereof as a mercy from us and a reminder for those who understand. SubhanAllah, it's mentioned that you, uh, Ayyub alayhi salam, he was a prophet who was tested with 18 years of sickness to the point that all of his near and far off relatives, all his acquaintances, everyone left him. So he was in despair. He lost his wealth. He lost his friends. He basically lost everything. But because he was patient, that was his highlight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded him by saying, 
to strike the ground with your foot. And what happened, a spring of water started to gush in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him his wealth and his health. And he became more beautiful and handsome than before. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rained on him gold and silver. Meaning his wealth doubled what we had, what he had before. Meaning that is the reward of patience. If we are patient, then the reward is doubled for us in dunya. And if not in dunya, definitely in akhirah. So Allah says, and we gave him back his family and along with them, the like thereof as a mercy from us and a reminder for those who understand. And take in your hand a bundle of thin grass and strike therein and break not your oath. Truly we found him patient. How excellent a slave. Verily he was ever after returning in repentance to us. So over here we see that the highlight of Ayyub alayhi salam was patience. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to learn from Ayyub alayhi salam and be patient over the calamities we go through. Allahumma amin. So with that said, we will conclude our session for today. Jazakumullahu al-khayran kathira. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana atina fil dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar. Allahumma anis wahshati fi qabri. Allahumma irhamni bil Qur'an al-azim. Waj'alhu li imama wa nuran wa hudan wa rahma. اللهم ذكرني من هما نسيت وعلمني من هما جهلت وارزقني تلاوته آناء الليل وآناء النهار وجعله لي حجة يا رب العالمين آمين سمامين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته